from you. Continue to be among us, O oh Lord. Continue to speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Continue to enable us to hear your voice and to find our confidence in you. For we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Life and death, living and dying. Those are topics we often think about, but we usually do not dwell on them. In the pre-corona world, we would read and hear news reports all the time about people dying, but we were quite used to hearing such things and usually didn't pay much attention to them at all. The writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us that there is a time to be born and a time to die. But he goes on to list 13 other pairs of realities in life that enable us to shift our thoughts quickly to other things so we don't have to dwell on those two basic realities of human existence. We all accept the fact that we live and we die. But it's hard to think about such things. So we try not to pay too much attention to that. We just keep moving on. In recent days, however, because of the coronavirus epidemic, we haven't had the luxury of being able to move on to other things. We are reminded constantly that large numbers of people are dying. And there is no light at the end of this terrible tunnel we are traveling through. We are grateful for all the heroic efforts being made by hospital workers, nurses, and doctors at great risk to themselves, like our own Kayla Soresco, who graduated just last year from nursing school and now goes to work every day in the emergency room at St. Catherine's Hospital as well as the countless other people who are working tirelessly, including our president, our governor, our county executive, and many other public officials who are living with constant stress, with no relief in sight. It isn't easy for anyone, and many are in grief at the deaths of their loved ones. Yet we try to remain hopeful and we keep longing for the day when everything will return to some form of normal, as it eventually will. It's because of what we're all suffering from, what, that, uh, from that the words of the Apostle Paul are so important to us today. In contrast to all the bad news we're constantly hearing, the Apostle Paul, in this letter to the Romans, gives us good news that we desperately need to hear. His message is clear. God has not abandoned us. In fact, God is very present in our world. He has taken up residence in our world. We've heard that good news before, but in these days, Paul's words bring to us a renewed sense of hope. And they remind us that God is indeed our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Because of what God has done, is doing, and will do in the world to come, we can keep pressing on. We don't have to be overcome by fear. Because of God, a better future awaits us. I'm sure we'll remember this year, 2020, for many reasons, but perhaps we'll remember it most of all because of the clearing up of our vision of who we are and what life is really all about. Paul reminds us that because of what God has done, the human race can no longer ignore God like we used to. In the past, all of us convinced ourselves that we are able to live our lives as though we were totally independent of God and everyone else in the world. People had the luxury of choosing how to live our lives, how to relate to other people around us, or not relate to them at all, and how to spend the resources we have. In the past, we could choose to use our resources just for ourselves and for our own pleasure, rather than using them for the benefit of those who have much less than we do. In the past, it was easier to ignore other people's suffering 
and go on about our business in whatever way we wanted to. But in these days, our whole way of thinking has started to change. Because of what God has done, we don't have to keep living that way. God has given us a much clearer vision of how God wants us to live. This way of thinking has affected us more than we realize, even as followers of Jesus. In the past, we believed we could choose for ourselves how much emphasis we would place on the regular practices of the Christian life. Each of us decided how much we would value such simple things as going to church, teaching children about God, receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion, caring for people who are weak, lonely, hungry, poor, sick, and disadvantaged, and homeless. We even believed that it was our choice whether we should be reaching out to people who have never heard the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. But that's not true any longer. That was never the way God wanted us to live in the first place as his children. For God really cares about how we live our lives. God is not far off, hiding in the corner of heaven somewhere, looking down at our world like we would watch a soap opera or a Netflix series. That way of thinking about God has never been true. The Bible makes it clear that God who took clay in his own hands, formed a human being and then breathed into it his own breath, has been part of the human experience from the very beginning. When Jesus took his first breath, God literally became one of us. And when Jesus bowed his head and took his last breath, God showed us how much he really cares for each one of us. Moreover, God's involvement in our world did not end with the death of Jesus. Three days after Jesus died, on Easter evening, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, he appeared to them and made himself known. He breathed on them and said, Receive Holy Spirit. The sins you forgive are forgiven. The sins you retain are retained. Jesus came to reconcile all people to God by forgiving our sins. And he commanded his followers to continue carrying out that mission. Yet God's involvement didn't end there either. Just seven weeks later, on the day of Pentecost, God poured out his Holy Spirit on those same disciples and empowered, empowered them to become apostles and take up the mission God began through his Son by proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and welcoming people into the body of Christ. God acted to free all people from a world held captive to the forces of sin and death so we might live as his beloved children forever. Paul clearly understood what God was doing and how God's spirit was at work in the world. That's why he said, when God lives and breathes in you as he does, and surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as a risen Christ. God lives and breathes in each one of us who are baptized. As Vicar Eric reminded us on Wednesday, with each breath we take, we experience the grace of God active within us. Like the air we breathe, we depend upon God every moment we are alive because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We don't choose God any more than we can choose to breathe. So we must never take God for granted. God gave us a gift of life for a reason, so we may live in fellowship with him, his creation, and with one another. God intends for us to be and to remain connected. And although for a while we may need to retain social distance from one another, we can never allow ourselves to remain spiritually distant from one another. His spirit is our breath. 
and that will remain true as long as we live. These are anxious times. People are suffering and many people are dying. We have much fear as we live from day to day. But we can never allow our fear to replace our faith in the one who gave us life, sustains our lives, and has promised us life in the world to come. Instead, we should rejoice. You can rejoice today because you already have that life. God's Spirit dwells within you and will continue to sustain you no matter what troubles may assail you. And you can rejoice even more because when you were baptized, you became a member of a community created by God in which His Spirit dwells. So breathe in, breathe out. We see the good news and rejoice today and every day in Jesus' name. Amen.